three, two, one. Hey, I'm Jad Abumran. I'm Robert Krulwich. Today on Radio Lab. Okay, so this is tape that was sent to us uh, by a radio producer named Bianca Gaver. At the time, she was in college, just starting out, uh, biking across the country. And so yeah, we just got this grant to bicycle around this summer and no kidding. talk to people. Yeah, it's called Davis what Projects a- for Peace. Oh, great. <laughs> and she was riding through this part of Tennessee and ended up on this farm-type place where she met this guy, Hector. My name is Hector Black. I'm 86, almost 86 and a half. When you get as old as I am, you add the halves again like you did when you were three. <laughs> um, so, yeah, where, where would be the best part, place to start? I mean, I think the story starts when he decided to move to Atlanta. Because that's where Patricia was, his daughter. Okay. He had fought in the war. As a combat engineer. Uh-huh. World War II. I was not a good soldier. At all. Went to Harvard, got a degree, and met his wife Susie. They, they and then... I did... Um, Join the civil rights work in the 60s. I, I think when Hector heard about the civil rights movement, he actually packed up his bags, moved to the neighborhood where Martin Luther King lived. We rented a house. And, and said, what can I do to help? I felt I wouldn't really understand what was going on unless I lived there. And that's when he meets Patricia, a girl in the neighborhood who came over all the time, just like a lot of kids, but she stuck around longer than, than anyone else. And at 11 years old, she asked them, Will you adopt me? Why don't you explain? Did you adopt Patricia? What happened? How'd you yeah, get she, her? Yeah, she, she, her mom was an alcoholic. Sometimes she drank up the rent money, and and the kids were out on the street with their mom and dad. Mom, there was no dad, and uh, so we took them in. She was very shy. She had impetigo sores on her legs, you know, nappy headed. No, her mama never braided her hair. She was just really a neglected child. And so she just blossomed. She got into reading, sewing, painting. She made all her own clothes. She was making bridal gowns as a second source of income. And then she went off to college. She came back and started teaching kids to read. She even took in a few kids, just like he had done. Adopted a couple of kids? Yeah. She was a, she was a wonderful child. So unfortunately, the whole story changes now in November of 2000, because that's when Patricia... Oh, God. Was murdered. Ivan Simpson is the name of the man who killed her. Yeah. He'd broken into her house looking for money. And he strangled her. And later the autopsy showed he sexually assaulted her too. I, at first, uh, you know, I yelled, I'll kill the bastard. You know, I thought, what kind of a monster would, would do a thing like this? And he said for almost a year he could not stop imagining what he had done to her. These visions. They'd come at me out of the blue, just hit me. Again and again. I just had no control. It was like he had control over me, pushing my face in the mud. After Ivan had confessed, and this was right after the murder, Hector said part of him did want Ivan to get the death penalty. Yeah, I was furious. But then this other part of him was like, no. This is a test. This was a test of his principles, of his beliefs. And so he decided he would not pursue the death penalty. It, at the trial uh, where he was sentenced. He refused to look at Ivan. Trisha's cousin got up first. She was just in tears and just said how much she hated him. I thought, oh, Lord, here I'm going to go say something that's probably going to hurt her feelings. And when it came his turn... I had a written statement because I wasn't sure how steady my voice was going to be. But I was saying how much we love Patricia, how much she meant to us, and how wounded we were by what had happened. And I said, I don't know if I've forgiven you, Ivan Simpson, but I don't hate you. I hate with all my soul what you did to my daughter. And then he worked up the nerve to turn around. To face him. To say the last thing I had written, that I wish for all of us who have been so wounded by this crime, I wish that we might find God's peace. And I wish that also for you, Ivan Simpson. And he says, when he looked up... Tears were streaming down his cheeks. And, you know, that's the first time I... I looked into his eyes, and it was like a soul in hell. I was just undescribable, looking there. 
In the end, Ivan ended up getting life in prison without parole. What happens next was so surprising and troubling to us, frankly, that we sent Bianca and our producer Andy Mills back down to Tennessee to talk to Hector again. Okay, so it's the night after the trial. Hector is laying in bed. In the motel. I couldn't sleep that night. And he kept thinking about that moment in the courtroom. I never, I never had a look like that my whole life. Never before or since. Over and over and over. And finally, he just gets up, he grabs a pen and paper, and he starts writing. Dear Ivan Christopher Simpson, I am writing because I wanted you to know how I feel after the court hearing Monday. When I turned around while I was reading my statement and looked at you, it was a very powerful moment for me. When you raised your tear-stained face to look at me, I thought... Ever since this happened, I have been trying to find something good in all the horror and pain. I have tried to be a better person. And then he writes this line, maybe as a way to push himself to be that better person. But he writes, I forgive you. For what you did to our beloved daughter. I don't know if this will be of any comfort to you, but I wanted to tell you. We will both have to live our lives with the pain of this deed always there. Patricia tried to make the world a better place. We should also try. Did you think he would write you back after that? I didn't know. But about four weeks later, a letter shows up. Yeah, this is it. Dear Mr. Hector Black and family, I first want to say God bless you all in all things. Second, I have to go straight to the point. I know God has forgiven me. You have forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Not yet, anyway. I have so much anger at myself right now, it's unbelievable. This hardness I have against myself. I will always be remorseful. I used to hear God speak to me all the time. But I guess after what I did, he took away his touch from me. Right now, I miss his voice. I don't know the level of love Miss Patricia had, but if it's anything like your example of it, it is great. God comfort you all in everything. Feel free to ask me anything you like. If I can, I will try to answer it. Dear Ivan, I was very glad to have your letter. I think it is important that we be as honest as possible with one another. And so I have to tell you that it is hard for me to write to you. I wanted to know who he was. I would really like to hear about your life, about the people who loved you, the people who hurt you, because I wanted to know what had happened to him that could make it possible for him to do a thing like this. Ivan writes, Dear Hector, I was adopted when I was two days old. His mother was schizophrenic. Mrs. Simpson, the one I call mom now, took me in. He was raised by his grandmother's sister. She's 82 now. I used to have to stay over there with my natural mom, while Marie, my mom now, had to work. My natural mom used to beat me. Blurt out, I'm glad I got rid of you. When he was a little boy, maybe about 11 or so, She took him and his younger brother and his little sister to a swimming pool, and she tried to drown all three. One sister died. He stood there while she she drowned his little sister in front of him. It's just the most horrible stuff. And so we asked him, having heard all this from Ivan, did he still blame Ivan? Or did he blame his mom or society or something else? Well, I, I do blame him. I mean, he made the choices. He made the choices. There's no doubt about that. But he says knowing this also made him want to write back. Dear Ivan. And tell Ivan about his life. I grew up in New York City. His family. Two brothers. My parents argued and fought a lot. Basically, his whole life story. I've always loved working with plants. And after we left Fine City and moved back to the country. And Ivan wrote back. Dear Hector. I was raised in the church, 
but after starting drugs and alcohol, I changed. Hector responded. Dear Ivan, I don't think God has abandoned you. Dear Hector, you're the only one writing to me now. We exchanged many, many letters. And at some point in this back and forth, this almost incomprehensible thing happens. Dear Hector, their letters... First of all, thank you for the pictures. I never knew plum trees blossom, really. Just become casual. My favorite bloom is the water lily blossom. They'd talk about flowers. It's beautiful. Things they'd read. Dear Ivan, thanks for your letters. I'm enclosing a story someone sent to me because I thought you would enjoy it. And sometimes... Dear Hector... Just the most mundane details of their day. Just sitting around this Saturday evening, been singing hymns to myself. Basically, they became friends. You know, Hector, you're right. I do sense a bond developing, unusual because of the circumstances. It's not at all what I expected to happen, you know. And it's just so absolutely crazy. You know, actually, <laughs> the t- <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, we 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 started to send him Christmas packages, you know, and we see this box on the floor, and I, I think to myself, Are you crazy old man, you're sending Christmas packages to the man who murdered your daughter. What the hell is up with you? You know, just so cross. So totally out of, like I was out of orbit or something. And I guess I was, because people don't do that. Maybe I'm trying to exact meaning from it. I don't know. Because I struggled so hard with why. Why? Eventually... After years of writing letters, Hector decided to ask that why question in its most essential form. What happened that night? This one, this one, I just want you to know, if you don't want to read this, oh, yeah. we, we, don't, we don't want to make you read this if, you, if, you're not, if you're not ready. I don't think it's... This might be a good time to say that this next part is disturbing. If you have kids or you're just not in the mood, Now's a good time to duck out for a few minutes. Dear Hector, I wasn't going to tell you all what happened until you asked. I'm also glad you're relieving me of details also. God bless you. I went into the house around 7.30 p.m. I'm used to breaking into place in the past, so I figured the house was total dark. So I broke out a whole window and climbed in. I took the VCR and TV and clock. I figured that was enough. Went and got $80 worth of drugs. I'm a heavy user, so it went in about one hour. So he made his way back to Trisha's house. It was still dark, so I went back in. He found his way into the bedroom. Saw a computer and stereo. So I said I take it, and that should last for the night. But I got trapped when I saw a car. So I hid until I could get back out the way I came. So I saw a lady walk to the room. I tried to be quiet so I could escape when she opened the door to a closet I was hiding. As she stepped back, she fell. I told her I was going to tie her up so I would have time to get away. She said, okay, sir. Her glasses fell off and at no time she saw my face. So I told her I was going to take the car so I could load it up. She gave me the keys, so I told her after I found out her name, I said, Patricia, I know you're scared, but I will be out of here in about 15 minutes. Then she said, you should get help with your drug problem. I told her I tried in the past, but I restarted. Yeah, that's, that's Trish. She had no compunctions about telling people off when they were in the wrong. And then I said, I'm sorry for this. I'm going to leave your car in the shopping center up the street next to the Chinese restaurant because all I need the car for was to transport the items I had. And even though Trish was tied up around her hands, she went to the kitchen and warmed up some chicken and rolls for Ivan. 
Then I said, I'm sorry, and I left again. I got rid of the things, got about $200, well, $100 drugs and $100 cash. Then I said, well, I just parked the car at the end of the driveway. Then I couldn't wait. I pulled over and smoked some of the crack cocaine. And at this point, he's really high. And he explained that when he gets this high, he sometimes hears a male voice in his head. And as he was walking away, the voice said to him, He said, well, go get you some sex. I told him, leave me alone, but next thing I know, I'm walking back to her house. No police had come. He burst through the door, ran to where Patricia was tied up, and said, Did you have any money cash? She said, look in my purse. And then Ivan said that the voice in his head became his own voice. And he said to her, I want some sex. She said, sir, you've been so nice. Why? Don't do that. He said, only were you going to do this if I'm dead. Okay then, and it happened. He strangled her, sexually assaulted her. Then he ran away. So around 2 a.m., I ran out of drugs. He said and that after he finished getting high, he started to wonder if he had dreamt it all up. So he made one last trip back to Patricia's house. So I looked up at the house, no police, and gate still open. So when I peeped through the door, she was still laying there. So I said, Patricia, Patricia. And then the voice in his head told him to go back in one more time. He sexually assaulted her. I couldn't believe what happened. So went to my mom. His adopted mother. And I said, Mama, it's something wrong. Mama, something wrong. She said, Child, tell me what you're talking about. I couldn't tell her. I was really hoping they would kill me in the electric chair because I I shouldn't be able to live with myself and God after what I had done. I just don't know why I had to do it. Was it because of the items and the money? No. Getting caught later on in life? No. Control or power? No. Car? No. Because she saw my face? No. She didn't see me at no time. Fingerprints left on something? No. I just don't understand why I did it. Well, I feel the pressure has left me for telling you first what happened. My mom doesn't even know. I've been keeping all this inside, and it hurts so. I'm truly sorrowful for what happened. May God bless you all. Sincerely, Ivan. Did it, did it help in any way to know? Yes. I mean, I, that sounded exactly like Trish. But she was, she was a really f- a fearless. I mean, I mean, she must have been a, I can't imagine what a horrible. Oh, God. I was just uh, amazed that she could be so strong. Just amazed. Because when you love somebody very much, you want to know about their last hours. And uh, he, he just... He just wrote it in a way that I, I, I found very kind. I mean, if you go, <laughs> kind is a weird word to put there. But, um, but that's the word he chose. Kind. After that letter, are they still write? Yeah, they still write. They've been writing for 10 years now, and Hector has just folders and stacks of these papers in his basement. It's the only room in his house that he keeps locked. Producer Bianca Gaver. 
Thanks also to our own Andy Mills. And thanks to you for listening. <laughs>